I think I remember seeing you in the wins channel on the accelerator, just like banging out, like win after win after. I was like, who the hell is this Hamza kid absolutely crushing it? Scaled it up all the way at about eight, eight to nine thousand dollars in monthly recurring revenue. Because who knew that one tiny YouTube video like that could just change my life as a, as a uni student, right? The choice for me is I drop out at the same time. There's always that part of me in the back of my brain, which is telling me, Hamza, you should have a backup. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we have a special guest, Hamza, a member of my accelerator and the original 150 members back in uh, this time last year. Uh, and Hamza's gone on to do some incredible things in the real estate and AI space, going from uh, being a student, working in an internship to starting his own AI automation agency and to pivoting down to an AI SaaS after he found a pretty lucrative uh, opportunity in the real estate space. So I think Hamza's story in particular shows the uh, the hero's journey of a, of a AAA owner or an AI entrepreneur and how you can get in and find your opportunity. And he now getting um, massive deal uh, potential um, and options for acquisition of his company uh, later down the line. So I think uh, everyone can learn a lot from this. And he's also going to be sharing a few lists to start again, uh, what tips and tricks to give to people uh, starting in his position. So Hamza, thank you for your time. And I'm looking forward to sharing your story. Thank you for having me, Liam. Yeah, it's a pleasure, pleasure to talk. Uh, I kind of found Liam, as he, as he mentioned, around April of last year. And the story kind of started in the middle of an internship. Uh, it was my first internship as a, as a first year kind of university student. I was hired for an engineering position. I was so excited. On my first day of work, my manager came in and gave me basically like a 10,000 row Excel document. And my, he told me my job for the whole four months that I was hired there was actually just to go through every single part, search it online and write like a long kind of standardization number for it. And that was it again and again and again. And it was just brain dead work. Uh, and it was so painfully boring that I started to put in my headphones and listen to YouTube videos and podcasts on the side. And that's where I found Liam Motley, this guy who is talking about AI and implementing AI in businesses and all this cool stuff. And so I was just listening to it while I'm doing this kind of brain dead job on the side and a kind of a realization moment happened. Why don't I just build something to automate this, this really boring process? And so that's where I started. I built an internal tool which used GPT to automatically write those standardizations uh, and then use Zapier to fill them in on, onto Excel. Uh, and I finished a year worth of work that they had for, for me to do that internship in like 10 minutes. Uh, and it was my first kind of eye-opening experience into how much value you can bring with these, these AI systems into large businesses and how little they really know about it. And over the course of the remaining three months I had of that internship, they ended up just transferring me to like the software department and I built a whole bunch of other internal tools for them to use, uh, even one to do like staff training for a bunch of the, the softwares that they were using, one to automate a whole bunch of different procedures. Uh, and that's where I kind of got started, joined the Accelerator uh, as one of the first 150 members. Uh, and then that's when I started my AAA. Uh, and then in AAA, it was kind of a rocky start. I think when I had the internship, it was awesome. So much experience building stuff, so much experience, you know, doing all that part, but I don't have to look for clients. I had the customer right there, right? The business stuff was kind of sorted. It was just like development. And then I started and getting customers was just a nightmare. Um, I remember the, those first couple of months, I hit up dental clinics. I hit up mental health agencies, like therapists and stuff. I hit up real estate agents, like realtors. Every niche you can think of, I was hitting them up. And it was all just coming back as, as zeros. And so it took quite a while for me to kind of nail down the, the niche of what I could do. Uh, and then kind of found my stride, I think, later that year when I had my first couple of sales. And one of the big ones was in real estate appraisals. So real estate appraisals is basically how people value properties. It's a very small niche. Most people have no idea how it works. I didn't have any clue how it worked back then, but I was talking to a real estate appraiser. I uh, also just happened to be a bunch of my family is actually in appraisals uh, over in the US, which I didn't know too much about. But when talking to them, they kept describing, hey, we're filling in these forms for hours every single day. The process is so redundant. Uh, the software we're using were built in the 90s and they haven't been updated since then a whole bunch of those similar complaints to what I was hearing at the company that I was interning at. And so I ended up just building them their first kind of internal tool just to automate one small part of the appraisal process. And it was so successful with them, it saved them so much time that they recommended me to one of their friends who was also an appraiser. I built them another tool, which was to automate a slightly different part of their process. They're like, okay, awesome, this is great. I brought it up to Canada from the US and then started marketing it here. And there was just the demand was flowing in and everyone was just saying the same thing, which is that we're looking for a way to make our process better, but there's no alternative out there. 
And so that's kind of where I pivoted from being a AAA, taking on any sort of client, any sort of customer, doing all those marketing and building these AI solutions into more of a SaaS. And that's where Automax was born. And so the way Automax works, pretty much I made, it was the all-in-one platform for appraisals, which automated everything from when an appraiser starts a process, they do their inspection, all the way to finishing the appraisal. I ended up hiring a bunch of devs at that time as well, who I also found from the accelerator. So initially I was going on like the, the Discord back then, well, before we had Circle, and looking for, for devs. And one guy really stood out to me, talked to him. We signed like an initial contracting deal, found another guy through him as well that he had on his team. And that's where kind of the team, team started to get built up from there. And then stuff kind of really started blowing up when I took some time off uni to work on it full time. Uh, and then started signing a bunch more and more appraisals, more clients, scaled it up all the way at about eight, eight to nine thousand dollars in monthly recurring revenue. And we have some really exciting stuff going on in the next couple of months. We have a potential deals for exclusivity with one of our clients and hopefully getting acquired by them as well within a year or two years. Uh, and stuff is really blowing up in the, the real estate AI market in, in Canada. So yeah, huge thanks to Liam for even starting all this. Because who knew that one tiny YouTube video like that could just change my life as a, as a uni student, right? Uh, so yeah, it's been an awesome journey. That's that's awesome, man. I think your story is such a great example of, uh, well, one, the, the internship aspect of the value of, exp of, of experience and you getting that early dose of experience and seeing firsthand what this stuff can do. I think people still come to this space with a lot of skepticism that AI, it can't really help the businesses that well or like it's not that valuable or even using low code stuff like Zapier etc is not going to be that valuable but you were able to see it firsthand and i think that was really key in, in your journey and for anyone else who can take the same approach of saying okay where can i get some experience in your case it was through an internship and just the, the right the cards kind of played out in the right way but taking the same approach of just any experience will do because you were able to take that experience and go straight into starting your own agency and then you were able to identify the use case through doing mm -hmm. multiple clients for uh, projects for clients identify that use case and then uh, double down and niche down to that and eventually get to the point where you prioritize that into a SaaS. So if there's any example of the exact strategy I've been telling people to, to try and follow in the space to, to succeed, um, and you've been able to do it really rapidly within the first couple of projects, I guess you were already finding a, a valuable solution. And I think that comes down to you having that, that prior experience mm -hmm. in the internship that allowed you to immediately start providing value. So um, if you want to give us a little bit more, I think the most impressive thing about what you're doing right now and where the SaaS is at, um, is the, the potential exclusivity that you've gotten. So can you give us a little bit of background on, I know you probably can't say too many details, but I think the size of the firm that you're looking at working at will uh, and working with um, could really show just what level you're at and what the, the potential is for you. Because I think with AI and real estate is such a huge market and you are like right on the, on the, on the edge of that, you're already into it. But if you continue to like press this, like screw this in and go deeper and deeper and deeper, you're going to have an extremely valuable skill set as you, as I'm sure you can explain mm -hmm. with some of the deals that have come across your table recently. Yeah, for sure. I think appraisals specifically within real estate as well is an even kind of further niche down kind of aspect of it that people don't even know how it, how it works. And so it happens to be that there's really almost no competition in the space either. The firm that we're talking to for exclusivity, they're the largest firm in Canada that does appraisals like uncontested. Uh, they have about 13, 14 branches across the country. They also have a sister branch in America, which has another 150 appraisers with several different branches all over the country. They also have a branch in Australia, another branch in Europe as well, right? And so they're by far the largest firm in the country. And the scale at which we could grow this working with them uh, is, is massive. I mean, you can only imagine if you have hundreds of dollars in monthly retainers per, per appraiser per user and hundreds of users at a time, the numbers just multiply and it works out to, to a really nice nice figure. Okay, so I think key thing to, to mention here is that you're managing all of this as a student. Yes, you took off your six months, you took your entrepreneurial break to work on the business, but now you're back at school. So you're faced with a pretty tricky decision here where you've taken the six months off, you've kind of done what you intended to do, which was find an opportunity here and get this thing rolling. With, and I mean, that's some of the most incredible offers and, and kind of opportunities that I've ever seen in front of someone. Like you have a very narrow implementation of AI that you've been able to create from scratch. You've got this big company, gigantic company, who's 
basically saying, hey, look, we want you to sell it to no one else and work with us exclusively. Um, and you're also trying to juggle this this aspect of being a student. Um, can you talk us through your thought process right now? And I mean, you're wearing the University of Waterloo uh, shirt here. And you've also, <laughs> as you said, were being approached by people through university as the as the AI guy. And that's leading to things through through the government mm. as well. So can you walk us through the uh, your thought process right now as a student and you're weighing these up, but also some of those, I think you mentioned governmental opportunities you're getting sure. just from, from doing what you've been doing. I think there's a lot of help that I got from being a university student while I was doing all this stuff, just because my university has a huge focus on entrepreneurship. We have like a whole branch of the uni, which is just dedicated to starting, like helping students start startups and companies and, and grow them and stuff. And so I was a part of that, got some funding to help the start of, of Automax, my company as well. And so I think it was really instrumental in finding the right people as well, right advisors and stuff as well. But yeah, this is the whole dilemma, right? Is you're working full time on something, you're you're putting your heart and soul into it, and stuff's going really well. But if you have to all of a sudden go back to school, it's not like the work just stops. The work just multiplies and adds on, right? You have all the stuff that from from your your uh, business working as well, and then all the studies, the five courses full time piled on top of it. So the choice for me is, I drop out, leave the, the cozy degree behind, and I pursue it full time, which is for sure enticing. I think. The, the opportunity is there. I think that's been proven over the last couple of months and there's exciting stuff possible. At the same time, there's always that part of me in the back of my brain, which is telling me, Hamza, you should have a backup. And you know, university is important. It's something important for, for me in my life. I know, Liam, you had a, uh, you ended up going the, the dropout route as well and, and doing all that. But I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a bit of a mental struggle at this point. There's all, there's always a possibility AI crashes and burns, right? A solar flare hits us and we're, we're going back to the stone age or something and you have to, to find something else. The important thing is that I don't think it's a degree that will get you success in life. It's having the skills and the knowledge that are necessary to be able to provide value to people. I could do that with a degree or without. And so just weighing my options for the time being and potentially going to, to bigger opportunities like uh, one of the connections that I got through my university is actually to the kind of municipal board in, in Canada that does property tax valuations. And so that's a different side from core appraisals, but it's a massive market because you have to appraise every single property in the country every year in order to find the government property tax. That's millions and millions and millions of dollars. So no idea how big the deal is, but it has a lot of zeros. It's funny because the irony of the biz of the university having a entrepreneurship department, but then like if it succeeds, what am I going to do? Drop out? So it's, do they not have a, a like exit strategy? So if we start a successful business in our entrepreneurship program, we allow you to like, or do you just have to at the, at the end of the day and make the decision? Hey, look, I'm done. This is done well enough. I'm having like a honorable discharge from the uni, but I'm going on to bigger and better things. Like, do they not have some mm -hmm. kind of process for that? So it's a mix of both. I think the main thing that they do is they like recruit students that are in like the end of their degree and then they get them started on their startup at the end of their degree. So as soon as they graduate, they move to the incubator full time and then they're only working on their startup full time. I'm in second year, really? so I have like two and a half years left if I was mm -hmm. to still, yeah, 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 do it. So way too early to, to do that. So for people like me, they were literally come up to me and recommend, hey, Hamza, why don't you just drop out? Uh, and so is it conflicting with the university? Sometimes, yeah. but it, ultimately it's all run by entrepreneurs as well. A bunch mm -hmm. of them are dropouts yeah. themselves. Okay. I guess the interesting part for you is trying to get a, a sufficient deal lined up, whether that's going to be exclusivity and you can make that transition say, okay, I think like whether that's them hiring yeah. you or whether you're getting a nice contract from them, would that be enough for you to, to drop this and go full time? That might push me over the edge for sure. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure myself and, and everyone else are rooting for you. I'm sure you're going to pull it off, but I think your, your story is such a great example of acquiring specific knowledge. And I, I've been harping on about this quite a lot recently and I'm going to continue to, but the understanding how AI can be utilized within a given niche, we are still searching for this, they're waiting for, I call them like empty thrones, right? Every niche in the, in the world, every niche in the business world. If you look at say SMMA, for example, there are guys who are established leaders or they have established brands and businesses in each of the different things, whether it's roofing or you name any, any niche you can, you can imagine. Um, we don't have that yet for AI. And in your case, you're starting to see the compounding benefits of being the AI guy. And you'll notice that as soon as you start putting yourself out there more, you get this weird kind of celebrity effect where everyone knows that AI is, is going to change the world and going to change their business. Everyone wants to be in touch with you. And, the, and you're starting to see it compound in that real estate, uh, in the real estate sector. And you're gaining that specific knowledge that no one else really has. Okay, how AI, you've got the appraisal section. Now you're going to go to maybe the property tax and you're going to have this wide view of everything in the or at least at the at the cutting edge of how AI can help real estate. So 
that's particularly what I'm most excited about for you. And I think anyone who's looking to replicate the success can also follow that same route of starting, whether that's consulting, whether that's just starting a personal brand and, and doing so consulting initially like I did and then moving into an agency and using that as a vehicle to identify use cases and work with multiple clients. And as you've done, niche down to it, start a SaaS, whatever you need to do um, to really bounce off, to pounce on that opportunity. So looking back on your past, I guess it's been a year and a bit in the space since you started watching the videos. Um, if you could give advice to someone yeah, who's starting sure. again, uh, maybe starting in your position or just interested in getting into the space as a whole, um, what would you recommend to do? Um, is there anything that you learned along the way that would be, uh, would have been a lot more helpful if you'd done it a bit earlier? I think one thing that's super important is to validate something before you go out and build and spend all this time and, and going into actually building it out, right? There's no point spending a year and a half or like several months building out this super complicated product that you think is going to change the world because it uses AI and you go and talk to the customers and no one wants it, right? You got to, I mean, even one of the guys I was talking to, he, he had like a hardware product. He built like a, a 3D printed prototype that did not work, took some photos of it, made like a, a fake video, put on Kickstarter, raised 250 grand in a year to actually build out the product, right? That's his validation. He knows wow. it's worth it, right? And so there's hundreds and hundreds of stories of people like that, that I've been exposed to in the past couple months. So talk to your customers, get LOIs, get an agreement, get something signed with them, which shows that they're interested, which shows that they have genuine need for whatever you're building, and then go out and build it. Now with no code tools, it's actually super easy to make that initial MVP. You can go on voice flow and within like 15 minutes, even you can have a super basic thing built up maximum, like two hours. If you want to add a little bit more functionality onto it, maybe use Zapier for some stuff as well. So build out a super basic MVP and go talk to whoever you're wanting to talk to. And the biggest thing is, um, in my experience, mass outreach was not working as well as personalized outreach. I think personalization is, is massive, especially with depending on which niche you're working in. Initially I was using instantly. I bought like three domains, like 10, yeah. uh, nine or 10 Last different email. emails. And I was doing like 500 emails a month or whatever, blasting it out. And the, the leads were just not engaged. Like if they got on a call, rarely did they get on a call. If they got on a call, they're like, why should we talk to a random guy that emailed us that is doing AI automations, right? As opposed to when I selected a niche, tried to really go down into it in, in appraisals as well uh, and start just DMing people with personalized messages based off of their profile. I had a really interesting call with uh, Nico on the accelerator earlier on, which which was like, we were super prepared going to the call, knowing what we wanted to do. And during the call, we booked a meeting uh, with one of the guys that I ended up also signing as a client like a little bit later on as well, right? And so being personalized in your outreach is super important for getting those first couple clients signed in. And then once you start seeing the, the stars align and the dominoes are kind of falling in place, you just have to grind it out. You have to get into the rhythm of doing it again and again and again and building systems at that point, which will scale, which is one of the things that I'm trying to do right now as well is even like build a team around myself that can scale. So I'm not needed to do every single thing. Uh, and yeah, that's where I think you take it from that stage to the next stage. Not everyone has the same story that I had. Not everyone has the same opportunities I had. Obviously there's a, an aspect of luck involved as well. Everyone has different paths and different exposures, but as long as you have the same kind of end goal in mind, regardless of your path, I think you can find a way to, to make it happen. Sure. Yeah. I think I remember seeing you in the wind channel and the accelerator, just like banging out, like win after win after. I was like, who the hell is this Hamza kid absolutely <laughs> crushing it? But uh, yeah. So when it comes to, I want to dig a little bit deeper into that personalized outreach, just so we're, everyone's hundred percent clear on, on what you're doing. So instead of getting a, a scrape and a lead list mm -hmm. from somewhere and putting it in and blasting out cold email, and I guess at that point when you were doing the cold email, do you think it was ineffective because you didn't have a, or were you doing cold email and the messaging was built around, I have built this for someone else and you actually had some kind of evidence of it? Or was it more just, I can build you this, would you be interested? So I think those are two different phases of doing cold outreach, right? Yeah, for sure. I think at that stage, I'd only had the internship experience and the stuff I built for that, but it was nothing for a specific niche. Like I was trying to cold outreach to dentists and I hadn't built anything for dentists. I was trying to cold outreach to mother clinic and done anything for them. So it was more general. I was trying to like use GPT to write personalized first lines. But even with that, the, the expense was up here and the results were just not cutting it for that. Uh, in terms of personalization, what it really was is I had a lead list of let's say 200 appraisers that I was connected to on LinkedIn. I started, I just made a profile really early on, started just connecting people. Also, I found it strangely, it was more successful connecting when I didn't write a connection message. If I just send a connection request, 
they accept it. But anytime they see a message, because I think you're trying to sell them something. Exactly, they think you're trying to sell them something. They don't. They don't accept it, right? And so I just had like a basic profile on there with some some like one post about real estate appraisals or something like that. I just started connecting the people. When I had 30, 40 connections, then uh, instead of just like writing the same copy paste and email uh, DM to each person, uh, me and Nico when we were on the call together, we went to their profile, found some of their recent posts, comments, or things that they liked, personalized a DM specifically for them, and sent that in. And then we started getting responses way faster. Uh, and so that was kind of what led into it. Yeah. Yeah. Nico's a whiz. I'm so glad we got him on the team. Um, okay. So personalized outreach. Do you think if you now moved it back to, I mean, now you've kind of got this exclusivity deal on the cards. Do you think if you switch back and, and maybe, I don't know, hopped on a call with Nico and, and got this start in, but if you were to use the evidence you have now, and maybe you built up your LinkedIn a bit more and you have more evidence to show what you're doing and you're laser focused on just finding more appraisers or finding more real estate firms you can talk to about potentially building different stuff outside of the appraisal space. Do you think you'd be getting a lot, a lot better results now with your call demo? For sure. I think it, it makes sense, right? Now now we have the niche, we yeah. have the evidence, we have the stuff, the system's built in. And so it's natural, that's the way yeah, kind of the that, scale that, forwards. That uh, reveals the, the hardest part about this whole thing. And it's that's finding your lane. And as you took a while to find that appraisal solution, this is the most difficult part for anyone getting in. We've only just niched my agency down to the education and coaching solutions for, for those kind of businesses. Um, it's not easy. And I know anyone watching this who's like, I just have no fucking clue where to start with this AI thing. I don't even know what tools to start working on. I don't know like how I'm going to get in touch with people. I don't, I've got a bunch of videos. I'll put one up here, wherever it is. That's the best one to start in terms of narrowing down your scope of what you're trying to learn. I think a lot of beginners get overwhelmed initially thinking they have to do voice flow and then, and then make and then Zapier and then Airtable and everything at once. And while it is good to know everything at once, if you can, starting off just with, okay, I'm just going to do voice agents and voice agents are selling very well right now. Uh, we're seeing in the school community and the accelerator as well. Uh, if you just narrow down to a specific type of solution to start, like you did playing around with the, in, during the internship and getting familiar with Make and Zapier, um, that narrows down the scope of what you need to learn. And that will sort of lead you to being able to uh, make a, a certain set of solutions. And from there, you can try to pitch those solutions or, or find people who are interested in them as well. But it's that finding of, the thing, which is, is so difficult. And we rely primarily, if, you, if you're if you looking to get started and find your first couple of clients, is warm outreach is the most important one. I mean, in your case, you were using some connections with your, your family that you didn't really even know were doing appraisals in the States. And then uh, personal branding as well. So if you have warm connections, guys watching this, warm connections are your best chance. And Hamazi has a great uh, podcast, or well, I guess it's a section of his audio book on warm reach outs and the strategy he recommends. All of you, if you don't have your first couple of clients, you don't have anyone who will allow you to get the experience like Hamza got in that, uh, in that internship, do that warm outreach strategy and try to find some people in your network. You may not even think you have any, but I promise you, you do. And if that doesn't work, then you go to inbound and personal branding and try to build a personal brand around it. So there's my little strategy session <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the video. Um, Hamza, Hamza, if there's anything else on, on that or anyone getting started, um, any advice you'd give to them, uh, feel free. Otherwise, we can probably wrap things up. Yeah, so friends and family first. That's how I got started. That's how virtually everyone gets started because that's the niche that you can have some competitive advantage in, right? There's hundreds of people out there that are even now doing AAA that are trying different niches. How do you differentiate yourself being in the niche of dental clinics from the 10 other guys that are going to be in it? You know someone in that niche, right? You know someone in, in there to get you started, which gets you in the door. As soon as your foot's in the door, stuff will pile up from that point, right? That's the hardest part. So yeah, go to friends and family, see see what's happening there, and then get a, get on from that point onwards. Yeah, thanks for having me, Liam. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for your time, Hamza. We are, uh, well, myself and everyone else is so excited for, for what, you, what you're doing, man. I'm, uh, can't wait to maybe have another one of these calls in, in six months, 12 months from now, and you've cut a deal and you're making a whole bunch of money now. Um, I'm so excited to see how you go with this real estate and AI niche um, because there's so much potential there, as you know. So uh, looking forward to seeing you on the channel again soon. And if anyone wants to get in touch with Hamza, more importantly, the whole point of these interviews, uh, well, the main point is to be able to get some exposure on on the people who are doing great work in the space. So if any of you are doing great work in the space, you can try to get in touch with me. I might leave a, a, a form down below if you want to apply for one of these interviews and you think you've got something cool like Hamza. But more importantly, Hamza's details are going to be down below. So if you are interested in real estate for AI or anything related to uh, real estate and AI or his services or, or working with them more closely, or you have an opportunity you want to bring him in on, then Hamza's LinkedIn will be down in the description. And I really urge you all to reach out to him um, before he gets snapped up by someone else.